Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our daily press briefing. This is briefing number eight. As you all know, we did not have a briefing yesterday because of the town hall meeting in Pajaro. Um, that town hall meeting was recorded uh, via video, and we did try to live stream it. Unfortunately, the weather interfered with our ability to do that. So we are going to be posting that on YouTube later on. We'll send out an email with a link to our YouTube channel. Um, so if you'd like to go back and watch that, you can. And we have another guest with us today. Um, but before we get to our guests and some of their opening statements, I would just like to review uh, just where we are uh, with the storm update information uh, so that everybody gets the same information at the same time. <clears throat> um, so currently, there are health risks to the people returning to Pajaro community, um, and we are working very diligently for a safe reentry on Friday, March 24th. <clears throat> uh, due to weather, due to changing weather conditions, however, we want to um, please mute if you're not muted. Thank you very much. We are keeping an eye on the weather um, should anything change, but right now we are scheduled for reentry on March 24th. If anything changes, we'll let everybody know immediately. Um, the orders. When the orders are lifted, residents will receive a text or email alert through Nixle or alert Monterey County. In addition, we will post it on our social media. We will provide media advisories to all those in the news media, as well as um, broadcast through our community-based organizations that we've been working very, very closely with and industry groups as well. Uh, some of those industry group uh, members are on this call today and will be helping to share that information. The evacuation order, however, does still exist for the Pajaro community and also areas of Arroyo Seco. It's important to understand that while we had seem to be hyper-focused on Pajaro, there are other communities within the county of Monterey that are suffering greatly. And those include some communities in South County. So we would like to keep those, keep those folks in mind as we do these press briefings as well. There also are evacuation warnings in areas of Big Sur uh, between Paul's slide and Gilbert side. As you know, Highway 1 continues to be a challenge with slides, and there are areas of closure where folks are not able to leave those particular areas. And we're monitoring that very closely, and we have regular briefings and updates with the folks down in the Big Sur fire, as well as the Big Sur community groups. Uh, finally, with regard to um, population that's currently under evacuation warning or order, it's approximately 2,300 people. Now you say that's not numbers we're hearing from Pajaro. The census data tells us there's about 2,000 people in Pajaro. Our estimates are about 3,500. So we're trying to, we're basically reporting based on census data, although we know the census data may not be 100% accurate. So please keep that in mind. Currently we have four shelters in operation. We have, we have capacity in all those shelters. Um, so um, if, if that evacuees who have chosen at this point to not check into a shelter, they are more than welcomed and will be welcomed with open arms and without any trepidation um, to our shelters. There's nothing to fear in our shelters. We're not collecting information and passing it on to any, anyone. Um, so that's the real big summary update. And right now, I'd like to go to um, environmental health. We have Marnie Flagg with us, who's one of our chiefs at environmental health to talk about some of the environmental health hazards that we are trying to reinforce and amplify with regard to the community of Pajaro as we begin the reentry phase. Uh, Marnie, um, welcome and please um, give us your opening statement. Thanks, Nick. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to reiterate that environmental health inspectors have been out in the field in Pajaro taking a look at uh, the structures that are out there. Um, and we've been um, applying documentation to homes um, and businesses. If we've come across anything that is bigger than environmental health, we do refer um, as needed to fire, building, PG&E, et cetera. Um, we are using yellow tags and red tags. The red tags um, 
Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> the red tags are structures have been deemed um, unsafe to enter or occupy by environmental health. And yellow tags are um, that they've been inspected and they're not safe to inhabit, but that they are safe to enter and go ahead and clean. And um, we are providing guidance and uh, information for everyone to be able to use to clean and um, go ahead and revamp their property um, at this time. We have uh, hygiene hubs where information and equipment is available and showers and laundry and portable toilets for residents as they enter into the Pajaro area. And these are available for you while you are there uh, assessing your property and getting started um on this process and environmental health uh, will have information packets available um, in english and spanish and tools to uh, educate everyone and we'll be there to answer any questions um, as you begin taking out the debris and separating it on your curb more information will be available on trash service um, and how exactly the process will um, move forward with that. As we get information, we'll give it to you. Um, so that's where we're at with environmental health. Um, I think I'll stop there, Nick, and then we'll take questions later if we have any. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Marnie. Appreciate you being here. This is important information that we want to make sure the community is armed with uh, as we begin the re entry process and the preparation for re entry. Also joining us today, um, is Barbara Hopgood from the health department. And it's important to continue to reiterate that the health and welfare of the residents of Pajaro is very important to us. And if we can just get a briefing on the health services that are available um, and will be we continue to be available to the Pajaro re residents. Thank you, Deborah, for joining us. Uh, good afternoon, Deborah Hopgood from the EMS Agency Health Department, uh, currently staffing the EOC in the med health area. Um, as Nick mentioned, we are working to continue to provide medical health services through the shelters, uh, the various shelters throughout the county, in addition to the Watsonville shelter. Um, we have staff including physicians, dentists, nurses, EMTs, social workers, and counselors who are all there to provide health care services for the residents at the shelter in Watsonville in particular. Um, they are providing a variety of services from assisting with patients' chronic ongoing medical conditions, um, helping with uh, access to things like medical equipment or devices that may have had to be left behind during the evacuation process, and also helping fulfill prescriptions as needed for uh, residents as well. In addition to that, um, they are addressing any emergency medical needs that may arise, uh, such as basic first aid or more severe conditions. So um, in addition to supporting the residents of the shelter, that same team of healthcare providers has also been able to provide support for residents who are not currently in the shelter. So they've been doing outreach in the community uh, to help with some of those same needs uh, for members who have chosen not to evacuate from the area. Um, in addition to that, and finally, I would say that uh, as we are turning towards re-entry, we are making plans to make those resources available directly in the Pajaro community. And that will include both uh, clinical and behavioral health resources um, in the immediate vicinity as needs arise. Thank you very much, Deborah, and please stay on with uh, so folks might have some questions in just a few minutes. I want to go now to Kelsey Scanlon, who's one of our senior planners at the Department of Emergency Management. Um, Kelsey is going to give you an update on the activities, a brief update on the activities of the Department of Emergency Management and where we stand roughly with regard to state and federal assistance requests made by the county of Monterey. Um, Kelsey is actually out in the field, so she'll be joining us via her phone. Um, Kelsey, please uh, welcome and um, please uh, begin with your comments. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Kelsey Scanlon, Monterey County Department of Emergency Management. Uh, the uh, Monterey County Operational Area EOC, the Emergency Operations Center is still activated. We are activated to a level two at present. Um, our main priorities right now are 
reentry and repopulation, which you've already uh, somewhat heard about the last couple of days. Uh, ultimately, we're responsible for coordinating the overall reentry process and ensuring that when the public enters back into their community, that it is actually safe to do so. Um, you've heard from uh, Mr. Pasquale the various hazards um, that are still very much present in the community of Pajaro that we need the public to be aware of. At present, the sewage is not uh, functioning. It's under repair. The water has been turned off to accommodate those repairs. And so when we allow the community back in, it's super important for them to have access to hygiene services, which is why environmental health has been so diligent in accommodating not just porta potties, but shower trailers and um, uh, laundry services throughout the community. Um, those two main hubs are where people can access those very vital services as well as information booths. And so while we set those up, we're also conducting the, those safety assessments of the community. We're closing in on finalizing the damage assessments. We're finalizing road repairs. Um, we're standing up those additional services and we're doing everything within our power and as quickly and efficiently as we can to allow the community back in. Um, so in the coming days, you'll see more and more activity in the community of Pajaro um, as we lead up to re-entry day. Um, I do want to first thank the community of Pajaro for their patience. I know they want to get home and we know that they want to start uh, cleaning up their community uh, and we will be there right there with them. We'll be right there with them uh, on re-entry day and um, we, we're doing everything that we can to wrap around them to the best of our ability under the circumstances. So, um, uh, if there are any questions about re-entry, I can talk about FEMA public assistance. Uh, why don't you go ahead with the FEMA, um, where we are with FEMA. I think a lot of folks are very interested in that, Kelsey, um, and uh, the community, not only the community, but the media, and a lot of curiosity as to why is this taking so long? Yeah, so we have, I've, as I said previously, we have submitted our request for state and federal assistance. We've submitted requests for uh, the California Department of Toxic Substances, Substances to assist with debris removal, and we've requested um, a long-term housing task force to assist us in supporting the community members who won't be able to move home uh, immediately. And we're very much aware of the housing situation in Pajaro, as it might be several weeks to several months before people can actually move back in uh, to their homes. Um, and so we've requested that state and federal support um, at this point in time that re those requests sit with the state and we're doing everything we can um, to, to get more help for Pajaro beyond the scope of what the County of Monterey can provide. Um, we highly encourage residents and community members to reach out to their elected officials um, uh, for more help and guidance on getting the attention of the state and federal government. I'm glad you said that, Kelsey, because we do have some local industry leaders and community leaders on the call with us today that are going to be speaking. I can't, uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, we uh, here at the County of Monterey have been on the phone every single day with elected officials um, trying to move this process along. We have sent dozens and dozens of emails, um, constant communication, um, and we actually need the community support. Um, if there's ever been a time when the old fashioned way of writing a letter or emailing your elected official is going to make a difference. Now is the time. Um, there is there's no doubt about that. So thank you, Kelsey, for bringing that up. Um, and, and I will say, you know, it's a it's it's challenging for for us here at the county because we we're, we're, not, we're not hearing as well. All right, let's go to um, I want to go to public works. Um, we have Tom Bonnegut, who's the assistant director of public works. Um, and, you know, Tom, as you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the sewer lines and things of that nature. And, you know, we know public works teams and contractors are working around the clock 24 seven to get this resolved. And, and I know you gave a great briefing. Uh, you and Randy gave a great briefing last night at the town hall meeting. But for those uh, in the media, if you could please give an update and um, perhaps uh, an indication of when we might expect the sewer lines to be up and running. Tom? Sure, I'll be happy to do that, Nick. Good afternoon, everyone. So as we reported at the town hall last night, Public Works is working hard to bring back the, the sewer line and the sewer system. And we said our target was to get that operational by the end of the week Friday. And so 
We're still on track to do that. Our contractor has finished fuse welding the bypass pipeline. Um, there was significant damage in the area of um, Highway 1, as I think everyone is aware. And currently, they are working on making the connections to the existing line. So that work is happening as we speak. Concurrently, there is a second crew further downstream uh, working on a few other problem locations that were recently made aware of. And so they're making repairs on those sections too. So um, at this point, we still remain on track to get that important force main repair finished so that we can be able to essentially turn on the system and, and hopefully have it operational on Friday to work with the timing that Kelsey mentioned. That's the end of my report. And thank you very much, Tom. And, and we do appreciate you being here. I know it's I know it was a tough tough day for you all and, and uh, thanks for making the time. And if you would just hang in there for a little bit, just in case some questions come up, I'd appreciate it. Um, we do have um, uh, on with us today, uh, Paro Valley, Sunny Mesa um, well, water representatives. Um, um, Judy is here. Um, Judy, I'm not gonna ask you to say anything if, unless a question comes up, but I do wanna let our, our media partners know that you are here and that your, uh, your organization, the Water District is available for questions. Um, so thank you, Judy, for being here. Um, I wanna turn to the business community. Last night at our town hall meeting, several folks asked questions about how is the County of Monterey going to support the business community? Um, and we've invited a number of folks that represent business and, and industry groups. Um, we have Paul Farmer from the Monterey County Business Council with us. He's got two of his um, associates, Jesus and Jose, uh, also from the Business Council. We are fortunate to have Norm Groot, the Executive Director of the Monterey County Farm Bureau with us. We have Kim Stemmler, who's the Executive Director of the Monterey Vintners and Growers Association. And I saw we had... Where did it go? Looking at the Zoom here. We have someone from the Strawberry Commission on, but I'm just not seeing. Um, Hi, Nick, that would be ah, Jeff Jared, Cardinelli there you go. from the Jeff California Cardinelli. Strawberry Commission. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jeff. Jeff Cardinelli no is here from the California Strawberry Commission. Um, so I'm gonna go to Paul Farmer first. Um, you know, Paul is a veteran in the business community in Monterey County and the Monterey County Business Council is very good partnership with the County of Monterey and our economic development uh, division. Um, Paul, if you wanna give some indication of how the business community is gonna be supported um, as we move forward through this disaster. Thank you and for being here, Paul. Of course, thank you for the invitation, Nick. Um, so I wanna provide just a little bit of background for you all on the partnership that the Monterey County Business Council has with the County of Monterey. Um, the County of Monterey received funds from the American Rescue Plan Act to help recover from, uh, from the effects of the pandemic. Uh, most counties that I know of did not do this, but the County of Monterey decided to dedicate some of that money directly to economic development efforts. And the partnership that was created between the county and the Monterey County Business Council was specifically to help with outreach uh, for businesses affected. There are a number of programs out there related to the pandemic that are valuable, but it's difficult for people to figure it out. So one of the things we did was we created a website at montereycountybusiness.com. We'll drop it in the chat in just a moment um, to serve it as a, a focus point for resources related to the pandemic. In addition to that, Jesus and Jose Luis, um, who are, you can wave their hands, they have the same background as I do. Um, they're on our outreach team. And what we're doing is going out into the community, talking to businesses, letting, listening to what their concerns are and tying, connecting them with different resources. Um, I will tell you on a personal level that I uh, went to Pajaro Junior High School myself and Jose Luis was out in Pajaro doing outreach a couple of days before this last round of storms and the, and the breaking of the levee happened. So we understand that we need to meet people where they are, and that's not always through the computer. Sometimes it's going out and building relationships directly with them. Now, unfortunately, at this point, the, the relief is not there, right? We have to work with the government and they have to go through their, their processes. We are following along as resources become available. What we want any business owners 
in Monterey County, if they're affected by, by the storms or the pandemic, reach out to us so we can be your lifeline to help resolve whatever problems are there. Sometimes it's hard to go through the paperwork um, we put together after after the January storms, the December, January storms, we put together a, a workshop where we invited people from different agencies to talk about what support they offer. We will do the same thing once the, the waters recede in Pajaro. So the main takeaway that we want folks to have is that when it comes to businesses that are damaged, um, you have people who are here working with you. We're a small team. But we're very diligent. We're appreciative of the relationship with the county and the county investing money in, in economic development and helping those people. I also have to say que todos en mi equipo somos completos en español. Everybody in my Spanish is completely uh, fluent in speaking Spanish. And so uh, that's what we're doing. We're getting out there, talking to people, uh, preparing things, helping them when it comes to filling out uh, grant and loan documents and things like that. So again, the takeaway, if your business was impacted, reach out to us. And uh, Nick, thank you for the time. And thank you very much, Paul, uh, Jesus, and Jose for being there and being there for the community of Pajaro. Um, I know that they will appreciate it uh, once they get back into their uh, businesses. Um, I also want to make note that we have Amy Ivey from Bay Federal Credit Union um, with us this afternoon. Um, Bay Federal Credit Union has come up with an emergency loan program. I'd like to give Amy just a few uh, few minutes just to, to chat about that. And um, Amy, welcome to the, the briefing. Thank you so much. I just wanna take a moment to extend our appreciation to all of you in getting our residents and our neighbors back in their homes and their businesses. Uh, we have released an update to our emergency loan program. And the purpose of this is to enable our members to have access, immediate access to funds uh, to support re expenses related to displacement or damage to homes and businesses. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce Megan Rhodes, our uh, Senior Vice President and Chief Lending Officer, who can share a little bit more about the program. Thanks, Amy. And thanks everyone for including Bay Fed in these conversations. Um, and as Amy says, you know, our hearts go out to all of our storm victims and Bay Fed is committed to be here for our community. Um, I'm pleased to say that we offer two emergency loans uh, to our storm victims. One is a personal loan um, for $2,500. There's no qualification other than to be a member of the credit union at a very low interest rate for an unsecured loan. And we also have a loan for our business community in the amount of $5,000. And the only qualification is that these businesses are members of the credit union. Um, as of right now, since the, uh, the first storms that we saw, um, we've been able to grant uh, a total of uh, 64 loans totaling, I'm sorry, 74 loans totaling 130,000 to our, uh, um, our community members impacted by the storm. And uh, we look forward, honestly, to help anyone that's in need this is for both Monterey and Santa Cruz County and San Benito uh, who experience any displacement or damage. Uh, so I look forward to listening to the other comments and being uh, a part of this conversation and offering uh, these loans to our community. And thank you, Nick, for including us. Uh, thank you, Amy and Megan, we appreciate you being here. Um, also, we have with us today, um, uh, we have, <clears throat> Excuse me, I, my Zoom keeps messing up. We have Jeff Cardinelli from the California Strawberry Commission. Jeff is the public information officer for the California Strawberry Commission. Obviously, you all know um, in the media, the strawberry industry is very strong in the Pajaro, Watsonville area. Um, it's the backbone, one of the backbones of the agricultural industry. Um, and of course, there's been a lot of um, questions and concerns about the impacts, not just on the agriculture industry, but how the agriculture industry perhaps uh, has an impact with regard to the flooding and, and what the residents of Pajaro might be facing um, when they go home. Uh, Jeff, would you like to uh, give us a little briefing on what the industry is doing um, to not only support the, the, the flood recovery, 
but how the industry stewardship is um, um, dealing with the um, issues of equipment and perhaps um, other uh, tools that the industry uses to cultivate their strawberries. Sure, thank you, Nicholas, and thanks for inviting the uh, Strawberry Commission to be a part of this uh, news conference today. So first and foremost, on behalf of the 400 plus farmers, shippers and processors of California strawberries all over the state, uh, we would just like to say that, that the thoughts first and foremost need to be with the residents of Pajaro and the other communities, Nicholas, that you mentioned that were affected by the flood. Um, we know that, that most of the residents in that Pajaro region uh, work in the strawberry fields or in other agricultural fields. And so we are, you know, we're very concerned for, for their living conditions, for returning back to home, what they're going to see when they go back home. So first and foremost, we're, we're very concerned for the residents in Pajaro. And to that end, um, it's important to mention that 97 cents of every dollar that goes from a, a strawberry production operation goes right back into the community. So that's one way that the strawberry industry is making sure that, um, that the residents of Pajaro are taken care of. 35 cents of every dollar goes right back into farm labor. So it's very important um, for the industry, but more importantly for the residents that they have a chance to get back to work. Um, it's also important to mention that the, uh, the strawberry industry is also supporting residents. We have a landing page on our website, and I'll put the, the link in the chat to, to direct those who are interested to resources to help the residents of Pajaro and, and the other communities. So those are just a few of the ways that the industry is helping out. I know there are individual companies in the strawberry industry that are doing uh, fundraising and raising money directly for the residents and, and the effort to, um, to get those folks back home and, and to get them back on their feet as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Jeff, for, for that briefing. And I know you'll be available for questions, as will Norm Groot and uh, Kim Stemmler, uh, Norm from the Monterey County Farm Bureau and Kim from the Monterey Vintners and Growers Association. Um, <clears throat> okay, I want to um, I want to go into I want to get to the questions. Um, just want to let our friends in the media know who is here uh, from the county or from our partner organizations to answer questions. We have representatives from our health department, environmental health from our Department of Social Services. Of course, we have the ag industry representatives that are here, the folks from the Monterey County Business Council, um, as well as um, water resources and public works. Um, so if you have any of those, uh, any questions whatsoever related to um, any of those topics, we're happy to uh, entertain them. We're gonna open up the questions. We're gonna go to the chat first. Um, and the first question in the chat is uh, from, Adriana Fredericks from KSMS uh, Univision here in the Monterey Bay area. Um, and this is directed to environmental health. Um, Marnie, if you would, uh, what is the difference between the yellow tag and the red tag? Sure, no problem. Um, the red tag is that the home is unsafe to enter. And the yellow tag is that the home can be entered and you can go ahead and begin cleanup. Uh, we do not recommend occupation until the home has been completely cleaned and um, set up again and has running water and sewer uh, to the home. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, all right, we're going to go to the hands raised before we we'll go back and forth and hand raise the chat. Then we're going to go to Barisa Cologne with KSBW. Uh, Barisa, welcome to the briefing. Go ahead with your question. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is regarding on the Friday comeback day. Is there a time for that um, for people to be allowed for the gates to be opened? And I understand the, the discussions prior were by zone. Is that still a discussion? Um, is that still a plan or is it just everyone all at once? What is it going to look like on Friday? Thank you for your question. Uh, Kelsey, are you still on the call? I know Kelsey was out in the field uh, on the Pajaro Bridge. Uh, May, do you have? Okay. Um, I think, uh, Brisa, what we're planning is the, oops, we're planning the, uh, the morning of the Friday the 24th. Um, and with regard to zone discussion, um, that has not been finalized yet. Um, we are going to be, when we do the re-entry, um, we're, we're going to allow folks back in uh, to the community in, in totality. Um, with regard to repopulation, 
uh, that's, I believe, uh, where we're going to get more into the detail on uh, the zones. So, Abrisa, if you would allow us to get back to you with more specific information, I'll get with Kelsey after we get done with this briefing and get back to you. And then you had a second question, Brisa, and I, I'm sorry, I missed it. I would just say my second question is, will the will there be any assistance in terms of cleaning the interior? I know you guys have the, you know, the restrooms out for people. Will will there be any ass assistance in terms of cleaning the interior of their homes? Great question. And the answer to that, basic answer to that is yes, um, there will be. Um, we are uh, working with contractors um, to help with that, as well as volunteer groups. Um, and so um, we will be, we're working on right now, actually, as we speak, a resource sheet That'll have information, names, phone numbers, and websites for the organizations um, and services uh, for the residents. And so um, we're hoping to have that completed by the end of the day or first thing in the morning so we can give those out to the residents as they reenter Pajaro. All right, that's going to go back to the chat. Um, incidentally, there has been some questions put in the chat that Maya has answered. Um, uh, in, in the chat, um, but the question was another one from Adriana Fredericks from KSMS Univision Channel 67. Uh, for those that will not be able to return home, and I'm guessing you mean live in their homes, what is a long-term plan? What efforts is the county deploying to make sure families have some housing, not in a shelter? Um, you know, Adriana, that is, that is a very, very good question. And we are working with a number of community-based organizations um, to make those type of arrangements. Um, a, a lot of this is predicated on the declaration of disaster. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for President Joe Biden to sign a declaration of disaster. Um, that opens up the county to get a lot of resources, um, including perhaps the possibility of FEMA trailers and the like um, to house folks. Um, this is something that's very much um, uh, being discussed every single day in our planning and making accommodations for that. There is no way that we want people not to be sheltered. Um, many folks have gone to stay with relatives. Uh, last night at the town hall meeting, we learned that many have gone to stay with relatives, um, some in the area, some out of the area. Many have gone to stay with friends. Um, many are in the shelters and, and sadly, um, many have chosen to stay in their cars. Um, there are a number of folks who did not leave uh, when the evacuation order was put in place in Pajaro, and so uh, without a doubt, and, and all the media has been to Pajaro, you know that there are people there, are people there um, mostly in areas that were not as impacted um, or impacted at all. So th this is something that's very much on our mind. Shelters are not home. We, we know that. Um, and we, under, we understand the importance of getting people home. All right, I'm gonna go back to the hands raised and we're gonna to go to uh, Thomas. Uh, Thomas, go ahead with your question, Thomas Hughes. Thank you, Thomas Hughes with Bay City News. I was wondering if uh, you could um, be a little bit more specific about what health risks are in the community and what is causing those health risks. Okay, thank you, Thomas, for your question. I'm gonna to turn to Marnie Flagg for that and possibly Deborah Hopgood um, to help answer that question. Marnie or Deborah, go right ahead. Um, so floodwaters, as you know, can um, pick up a lot of hazards and debris along the way when they travel. And so that's the health risk um, that we're concerned about um, when it's in a home over a long period of time we run the risk of mold um, and other hazards growing over time. Um, food rotting, uh, then we have the attraction of vectors, rats and other uh, critters coming into the area. So that's what environmental health is concerned with. That's why we want to get the cleanup process started, um, start sanitizing and start getting that food out there, out of there and start getting those attractants for those vectors out of there. Um, uh, that's, that's the component that environmental health is concerned with. And right. before Friday's re-entry, are those health risks expected to be removed or, or are you expecting to come Friday that re-entry will happen while those health risks remain and you guys are still doing your, your work? And that leads me to my other question, which is, what is the interim period? I, it seems like 
Friday might be a misleading terminology for re-entry for people who are going, as you've described, only to assess the damage and begin cleanup. But for people who think that they're going to be able to stay the night and move back home Friday night, what's this interim period where health risks might still exist, but people are being invited back into the community such that you're setting up laundry stations for them? I mean, are people being invited back to live? And if not, is there a, a rough timeline of, of when that will be or, or when the health risks will be removed while people are being invited back in? So that that's what's going on. So we're opening up the community to let people come in. The longer we leave it the way it is, the more the health risk increases. So the community will open up. Everyone can, you know, come back, get in there, start the process, remove those risks. And then we've put in those facilities, the laundry facilities, the shower facilities, so that when they're done with that work for that day, you ha they have something to go to, to launder those clothing, the things that they were wearing that day, to get another Tyvek suit, to get boots, to get cleaning materials, to get the things that they're gonna need to keep that process going so that it's not just gonna sit there and continue um, over time. And will they read transportation back to the fairgrounds or, or my understanding that you do, we're gonna, people are going to come clean and then go back to the shelters? And again, just for Nick, is there a, a, an est, even a loose estimate of when that interim period, how long it could last? If they're going in, they're going back to the shelter. When do we think people could go stay the night safely? So there are there is transportation going to be made available to the shelter and within the community of Pajaro. So we're, we are making those we are making those arrangements actually are made already. And we have an agreement with Monterey Salinas Transit to provide that. Um, as far as when people can, like, like Tom Bonnegut said from the, from the Public Works Department, we're hopeful that that sewer system will be up and running um, by Friday. Uh, once the sewer system gets up and running, um, Judy, um, we, are gonna, we know the Pajaro Valley Sunny uh, Mesa Water District will be able to turn back on the water system there is a certain period of time where that system has to be flushed in order for um, contaminants to be essentially purged from that system. Um, so I think this is, we're talking about a matter of days, um, not to say that debris removal will take a matter of days, it's gonna take longer for certain people than others. Um, but you have to remember, Thomas, that there was varying degrees of damage in the damage assessment. There were nearly 500 homes in Pajaro that were not damaged at all. Okay, and there were roughly 400, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, uh, according to CAL FIRE, but there was roughly 430 somewhat homes that had, you know, some impact could be minimal um, to minor, uh, to moderate, to major, and then, as indicated by the CAL FIRE report, the number that I, that I can remember is the three, home, three structures, not homes per se, were destroyed. So it's for each circumstance, there's going to be a varying amount of time. And we're not just talking about a few days. It could be several days. It could be a, a number of weeks. Um, but it's, it, this is a, it's, a moving, it's a moving target, and it, it's difficult to, to pinpoint a time. We're not, we're not trying to avoid giving a day. We just don't. We want to set reasonable expectations for people and knowing that it's going to take time based on the individual circumstances. If any of my county colleagues would like to weigh in on that, um, welcome that as well. Uh, Nick, I wonder if we should not explain the difference between re-entry and repopulation. And I wonder, Marnie, if you're still on the call, if you could define that. Because I think people think going into this event, it's repopulating, but what they're really doing is re-entering. Right, it's really important to understand that repopulation can't occur until we have functioning sewer and functioning water in the area. Um, and our teams are working on that um, diligently and actively as fast as they can, as Tom and Randy have reported. Uh, the sewer system is getting back up and Pajaro Sunny Mesa is you know, doing um, as much as they can to get the water system flowing um, and getting back into the pipes for everyone to use as quickly as they can. Right, and Marnie, I, I also want to add that what people need to try to remember is this was not a flash flood. This was not floodwaters that came in in a few hours and then receded in a few hours. This was a major disaster 
this was a major flood the, where the water was standing in some cases you know four five days so there's still places where there's water um in in particular in loading docks of buildings and things of that nature so it, it's 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 not well, you know what some of the things we, you know you see in other parts of the country where the water comes in and it, and it goes um so it, it it creates different sets and different complex challenges to face i appreciate the question tom and we appreciate your interest in following the story i want to go to leslie duarte from ksbw action news 8. leslie welcome hi hello this is leslie thank you so much for having this briefing today um i know our focus today is on the re-entry um, for the Pajaro residents that were evacuated. Um, but today my focus is on the people that stayed in Pajaro. I talked to a few residents there and they've given me different concerns. They hope that the county can help them. Um, they're talking everything from having a medical truck visit the residents that are did not evacuate that stayed in Pajaro. They also want to know if they can get their trash collected. Um, they just send piles and piles of people's backyards and just trash that they've um, accumulated from staying in their houses. And as well, um, somebody on this call mentioned that there was medication uh, pickup location for people that you know left medicine behind or need a refill. Does that also extend to the people that stayed in Pajaro? And if so, where is that location? Okay, so what, most of your questions were health related. Um, I'm gonna turn to Deborah Hopgood um, from our emergency medical service. Uh, Deborah, um, maybe you can address some of those questions that Leslie had. Yes, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, we are working to make uh, medical resources available within the community itself. Um, that does involve some access challenges, as you know, the area is under an evacuation order currently. So we're working with uh, law enforcement and EOC representatives to be able to bring those, uh, those critical medical and healthcare resources into the area. Um, and that's a, a, a process that's in progress currently. Um, I don't recall mentioning a particular spot to pick up medications um, for those who have not evacuated and are not staying in the shelter. Um, the shelter residents um, have access to many sources for assistance with uh, refilling their prescriptions on site at the shelter, uh, whether that be through uh, community groups such as uh, Salud para la Gente or uh, Clinica de Salud. Uh, they're both providing those services. Um, additionally, Red Cross and CalMAT have been assisting with medical care and things like uh, prescription or medical device needs. Uh, the first source of help for anyone um, who has chosen to stay in the evacuated area or maybe staying with a resident would be to go to their uh, person who originally prescribed the medications. They're gonna be in the best place um, to know that patient's uh, medical history and be able to assist with that. Uh, many of the insurance providers and healthcare providers have put processes in place to streamline their ability to provide either refills or replacement for those lost medications, as they're uh, certainly aware of the, um, the storms and floods and the challenges that arose with those. Um, there are, um, I would, uh, I guess, encourage people, and Nick, let me know if this is the right direction to reach out to 211, and then we can help with uh, any individual instances where uh, people may need uh, further assistance beyond what they may be able to um, obtain from their healthcare provider. That's perfect, Deborah, and, and uh, thank you. Yes, 211 is a great resource for the community. Um, 211 is actually uh, has a representative here in our emergency operation system in the Joint Information Center, and uh, they get the same information that we get here at the EOC. So um, that, that they are up to date with all the information and referrals. Um, so thank you, Deborah, for that. Leslie, did you have a follow up? Yeah, I did. Um, would you guys? Um, the question that went uh, unanswered was a trash uh, pickup for people that stayed in Bajaro. Do you guys have a the company coming to pick up trash or how is that going to work for people yeah that's a good question and and we did address that last night in um in the town hall meeting um marnie um i don't know if you can um kind of give the rundown on that i know that um uh, we're going to be doing debris removal and the, the debris removal has to be done in a very precise way leslie um not our regulations but fema and state regulations um, but there's also arrangements with uh, the contracted hauler uh, to begin service at a particular time. Marnie, why don't you go ahead and um, finish my <laughs> finish my incomplete answer. Right, um, the county will be offering curbside uh, debris removal services 
to the community um, beginning as early as this coming weekend. The flood debris removal service will be free to residential property owners in Pajaro. Um, they will only accept uh, flood debris. Uh, food waste will have to be moved to the curb and separated. Um, and sorry, flood waste will have to be moved to the curb and separated into you know electronics, uh, appliances, hazardous waste, other other debris. Um, household trash will be into the regularly serviced bins. Um, there will be no trash bags used, which will be uh, an interesting concept to get used to. But um, part of the FEMA reimbursement is that everything is uh, categorized and looked at um, when it comes to flood collection um, and flood waste. There will be shovels and wheelbarrows, dollies and other equipment and volunteers and organizations that will be there to help residents um, moving the debris. Uh, we will have to get cars moved. If you have an inoperable car, we'll cross those bridges when we get there to help uh, get those cars out of the way to push that flood debris out into the street and the curb. Um, we will, environmental health will be out there instructing everyone, uh, getting, getting that knowledge out on how to, um, organize that that debris um, to get that project off the ground. Um, business owners and property owners, we will, or business owners um, will have to um, kind of construct a plan on their own and contact a service hauler to arrange cleanup um, for their venues. But we are working on something to try to help those business owners. Um, and we're developing um, something that we can to try to get some something in place for business owners um, separate from uh, our private residences on the side. So the, the debris removal plan is coming into uh, fruition and you know we're, we're working as diligently as we can. Uh, regular trash service for areas that is, are not impacted um, is going to begin as soon as the area is open. So uh, hopefully Friday, you will have regular trash service beginning in areas of Pyro. Thank you so much. And yeah. um, just a clarification on the medical um, aid or medical truck coming to Pajaro um, for the residents that stayed in uh, the evacuation zone. Do we have a date on when that will uh, be there or will it just be as everything else uh, Friday? When everything reopens we don't have a particular date um, whether or not those services will be able to um, provide access earlier than friday um, we're still working through those approval processes so um, we hope to be able to provide services early but it, it's still very much a plan in progress and in development thank you thank so much for your time thank you thank, thank you. you leslie for your question jeremiah i'm going to get right to you in just a second i do want to uh, mention um, that we we did have representatives last night from the Watsonville uh, Legal Assistance Center, as well as the California Rural Legal Assistance uh, Organization. Um, we are facilitating information for residents of Pajaro Disaster Legal Assistance, and we are actually distributing and have been distributing um, flyers explaining what their rights are. And this is an example of the flyer that's up right now. Um, out into the shelters. It's in English and Spanish, and it's provided by the Disaster Legal Assistance Collaborative, which is a nonprofit organization that provides legal assistance to disaster victims. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Jeremy from KAZU. Jeremy, you had a number of questions in the chat. I'm, I'm assuming you're going to ask the same questions live. And then uh, your questions were similar to Barisa Colon's of KSBW. So, Jeremy, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, so is is the county going to, um, I'm trying to think how to ask this, uh, once once reentry happens, is there anything that the county is going to do to prevent people from repopulating their homes, given that there might be hazards? Um, is there anything that they can do? And then um, kind of similar to that question is, uh, will reentry happen at all? Will there still be an evacuation order um, until water and sewer are reconnected. Um, will reentry happen before water and sewer are available for the community? 
Uh, so re, uh, as we as has been stated a number of times, um, the the anticipated date uh, for the sewer to go back online is going to be Friday. And at that time, shortly thereafter, the water company, um, Paro Valley Sunny Mesa Water, will be able to turn on their system and the systems will be checked. It is my understanding that Paro Valley Sunny Mesa will uh, turn on their re uh, reserve system first um, as a safety measure uh, before going into the main line. Um, once the reentry happens, the sheriff will list the evacuation lift the evacuation order. The evacuation order will be lifted. Um, with regard to folks staying in their homes, the county or nor the sheriff's department is going to, you know, make people leave. Um, I think, you know, um, we, we are advising them strongly. Um, Marnie can um, add to this. We are advising them strongly and warning them of the potential hazards if they uh, if their home has been impacted um, with floodwaters, what those hazards are. Um, we're giving people all the information that we possibly can so they can make decisions for themselves. Um, so Marnie, would you like to um, expand on that? Uh, I think that you, you know that's that's what's really important that we keep repeating that message that you know the your the the homes that were impacted by floodwaters need to be cleaned out and dried before they're reoccupied. It's very important that the residents realize that you know occupying a home that has not been cleaned out is is not a good idea. It really does need to be uh, mucked and cleaned before reoccupation. Right, and we are providing that very specific instructions um, to that end uh, for the residents. In fact, the environmental health folks, along with several volunteers from county departments have been putting together packets for the residents that have detailed information about the procedures and the safe ways to clean um, their homes. Um, you wanna go ahead with your second question, Jeremiah? Yeah, my second, yeah, sure. My second question is um, pretty unrelated to that first one, but uh, I guess if the county's contacting um, the state frequently and really sounds like the state and the federal government are the ones that sort of uh, at this point that will get to the point where there might be FEMA assistance, more FEMA assistance in the future. I'm just wondering like if there's been any explanation as to why it's taking so long that you've heard. Um, I just think back to January in Santa Cruz County, um, there was a major disaster declaration uh, about a week after the Capitola businesses were impacted and we're way past that point now and I read something on the FEMA website that it, that part of the calculus comes down to you know a per capita cost um, and I'm wondering if there's a chance that we won't actually see that support because it's a low-income community. You know uh, Jeremiah I'm not going to speculate um, on that um, you know the county of Monterey is committed to that community period uh, there, there's no, there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Our, our commitment is there. Um, we're working feverishly to to get the community the resources it needs. As you know, we had a delegation from Sacramento and from Washington D.C. last Friday. We took them on an extensive tour. Uh, they saw the levee. They saw the community of Pajaro. They went to the shelters. Um, our chief administrative officer for the county has been on the phone every day with uh, elected officials in Sacramento. Um, we've reached out continuously to our, um, our colleagues at the state. Um, and, and let's put it this way, no stone is being left unturned. With regard to meeting the threshold, the County of Monterey's paperwork is ironclad. Um, it is accurate. Uh, the initial estimates are over a hundred million dollars and that meets the threshold that more than meets the threshold uh, for this. Um, so the, the answer, the short answer to your question is we don't know why this is taking so long and we are anxious to get an answer. All right, I'm gonna go to you. Leslie. Leslie, you have your hand up. Oh, sorry about that. I think that was just some error. Thank you. Okay, great. 
Um, does anybody have any questions for the uh, our, our folks in the business community or the ag industry? Because it's important that we remember um, that uh, the, the business communities have been impacted as well as the agriculture industry. If you have a question for them, they'd be happy to answer that. Okay, um, seeing no I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask just for one question for Bay, Bay Federal Credit Union is you have to be a member to access these programs. How easy is it to become a member at this point if you're not? Uh, I can answer that. Um, it's very easy to become a member of Bay Fed. They can walk into a branch, they can call or they can apply online. So those emergency loans are available online. Um, one of the caveats is that they needed to be a member prior to today or prior to the event. Um, but if there's some uh, extenuating circumstances, they can reach out to me and I'm sure we can get them some help. Great, and thank you for that. Go ahead, is Thomas. There, is there an estimate between, I mean, one question I had is why, for just for the debris removal, why differentiate between businesses and, and residences? But to, to the businesses, is there any thought of how to help them or residents with rent. So how many how many businesses actually own their shop and how many residents own their homes? Is there any sort of estimate to that or are you in touch with property owners? Well, OK, so I can answer that. Um, the answer is yes, we are in touch with the property owners um, uh, based on the information that we have um, in our assessor uh, departments. About 75 percent of the residents are, are renters and about 25 percent are uh, owner occupied or, or um, yeah, owner occupied. Um, so with regard to assistance for the renters, that's why we've compiled a team of, of uh, community-based organizations to provide uh, legal services for those organizations. Um, with regard to business, I see Paul has his hand up and, and has some thoughts on that. Well, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, and uh, Thomas, I appreciate the question. My team and I were talking about what concrete things we could do to help the business community because until uh, President Biden signs, you know, the federal declaration of disaster opening up, you know, it's like a lot of talk, like we're here to help when, when things come. But one of the things that we may be able to do, and I'll make a call immediately after this, is uh, working with those local disaster recovery companies. There are a lot of them out here. Um, I have relationships with a number of them. And I was wondering if maybe there's something they can do. You know, when the flooding was going on, hospitality reached out to hotels and they lowered rates for locals if they needed a place to stay. So I'm wondering if maybe we can help broker something with these disaster recovery companies because that stuff costs a lot of money and uh, people need to have that fixed so they can start their business. And maybe, that, maybe that's an opportunity for us to use our business relationships with those companies so I'll be exploring that further. So thank you for the question, Thomas. And thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, and interestingly enough, Thomas, there we did talk to a number of property owners uh, last night at the town hall meeting. And the ones I spoke to at least, um, fortunately, um, they had insurance. Um, so um, those are things that we're, we're also coaching um, residents um, on, on how to document their damage and things of that nature so that they have something firm and concrete they can go to insurance, uh, their insurance companies with. Um, and then going back to your question about why the difference between uh, commercial uh, debris removal and residential debris removal, those regulations are established by the federal and state government um, and our environmental health bureau and you know the, all those involved on a local level are complying with state and federal laws. Um, so you know these are these are not decisions that are be made to put a burden on the business community. These are these are things that we we need to follow based on state and federal guidelines. And if we don't, there could be consequences for not doing that. Um, Derek uh, Derek put a question in the chat um, with Derek's with KION. Thank you, Derek, for your question. Uh, I wanted to ask when is environmental health expected to complete all the inspections of the houses and structures before Friday's reentry? Um, Marnie, if you have that information, that'd be great. Hi, Derek. Uh, our last team of inspectors is out today. So we anticipate uh, weather permitting to be finished today. Thank you very much for that, Marnie. Appreciate it. 
All right, so we're at the two o'clock hour. Um, this session has been recorded and the link will be made available as soon as we can get it uploaded uh, to our YouTube page. Um, we really, I do wanna give an extension of appreciation to all our reporters that are on here. Um, yes, sometimes it's difficult to get you the answers that you want uh, or the answers that people wanna hear, but we're doing our best to do that. And our C CAO, Sonia De La Rosa, wanted me to extend her appreciation on behalf, on behalf of the County Administrative Office and the Board of Supervisors uh, for your efforts in getting the information out to the community. So we thank you for that. Also wanna thank all our guests today on our briefing. Um, we will have a briefing tomorrow as well as Friday. Um, please stay tuned for that information so we can give you up to date and the latest information. For now, thank you for attending our briefing number eight. Have a great rest of your day and stay safe if you're in our community.